about the way that you talk about time in this in this poem and the way that maybe Larkin would how would he relate to time and how would he relate to the same moment if it were today? And then that got me thinking about Alex's students and then it got me thinking about Frankie talking about time and we've got basically like a few minutes where we can ask some questions. Perfect. So let's, let's take some time and ask some questions. I'd like to really encourage questions that link the three speakers together, but if you have a question for just one speaker, it's fine too. So let's open the floor. Has anyone got any questions? Yes, James. Um, I can't really link you together, but I've got questions. Um, to each of them, actually. Um, I love, Francesca, your talk, the way that your machines gave out on you. And you it's such a brilliant illustration of your talk. And it reminded me of a brilliant um, satirical piece in a Sunday magazine of, of a newspaper um, about existentialism, about Jean-Paul Sartre, mm -hmm. where it, um, it, it pastiched a, a kind of existential play called Les Chaux Sans Contrary. Uh, things are against us. Really. Mm -hmm. The uh, toaster doesn't work properly and it falls down the stairs and the, everything goes. It is absolutely hilarious. Um, and, and I think um, the connection with Marvel is because it's just exactly the same kind of thing in that corn crate. It's a corn crate isn't it? Yes, that's um, right. That, of course, were common at the time. Um, and, and it's exactly the same thing. I think the way Larkin does that, he does it in um, Anglo Saxon stuff as well. It's always the same thing going. It's actually an Anglo Saxon riddle. It is one, you know. There's nothing different between it and Anglo Saxon riddle. Um, that's just a comment, really. Um, I'll, I'll dash on because I'm to take too much time. Um, Alexander, Alex, Alexandra Yields was a, a lovely, a lovely paper, um, and um, it just made me think. It made me think of Shakespeare all the time because Shakespeare can get away with anything because he can just put it in the mouth of a character. Yes. So he puts it in the mouth of anything, and it's not as horrible as it was. He puts it in the clown's voice. It can be as ribald as you like. And it doesn't matter. Whereas Larkin does that, but he, he does it in inverted commas. He does it in a primate letter, as you say. Um, prison for strikers, bring back a cat, a cat of nine tails. Um, kick out the niggas, how about that? And then in, he, he sends that to two different correspondents who he knows will accept it and will take that kind of language. Um, Amos and Gunner. To Gunner, he just leaves it flat because he knows Gunner will just agree with it. Amos, he says, ooh, Mr. Larkin, um, uh, I, um, I'm surprised to hear you uh, expressing such sentiments. He knows exactly what he's done. But he's got to do it. And why shouldn't he do it? It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect piece of, of, of doll poetry. We did, talk, we did talk quite a lot about the fact that, obviously, you know, they've read Merchant of Venice in year eight, and there's a, a great case for saying, yeah. well, yeah. of course Shakespeare's poking fun at the Jew here, and his crowd would have loved it. Um, and they, obviously they're taught that, well, we don't really know what Shakespeare thought, so we just leave it. Whereas I feel as though Larkin, he occupies that really un unfortunate space, if you like, yeah. if you're thinking about the protection of reputation, yeah. in that suddenly everything's out there. Um, and we also talked, interestingly, about the, the extent to which perhaps not having a family of his own meant that his reputation perhaps wasn't as carefully guarded as it may have been by family members after his death. Um, but yes, it, essentially, how long, how long do you wait before it doesn't matter what someone thought in their time because it's so clearly another time? And we're not there with your Larkin yet, whereas with Shakespeare, you're right, they can... And they can accept <coughs> all sorts like that about and, and sometimes it, 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 it is, you can see that it's actually deliberately being surreal. You know, mm -hmm. I'd like to see them starving, the so-called working class. Their wages daily halving. So they don't have nothing after the workers. <laughs> their women stewing grass. Their women stewing grass. I mean, the is paying over the top, and he's done it in those kinds of Shakespeare does, he would have put it in the... Merchant of Venice, I think, for the interest of Shylock, is such a 
brilliant character, and so many, he gets such a good, he gets such a good, um, uh, it's a good part. You yes. know, enjoy doing it, you know, like, because you know you're going to get people on your side when you're acting. Um, the, the other, um, and then the time thing. Um, I've got a question here. Um, do you think that, the, I mean, church going, it often surprises me that church going is so liked by those kinds of Anglican who like fellow traveling atheists and get on with them and, you know, people like Benjamin and so on. And Benjamin, of course, loved Obama. And, and actually, I think, wrote atheist poems himself because of Obama, oddly enough. Lying influence, Benjamin, and all that. But um, it always strikes me that the church going is actually a very anti Christian poem, very anti religious in a way. Um, it's not anti transcendence, <coughs> it's not anti looking up and seeing the light streaming through the clear story and um, someone would know what that means, I don't know. Um, uh, that is, is one thing. Um, but there's no, there's, absolute, there's an absolute rejection, is there not, of uh, any kind of um, Christian doctrine? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 don't, I don't think for a minute that he's subscribing to um, no. any kind of uh, Christian doctrine, it's just the sort of tender intimacy of the details of the church that kind of explain why people might want to invent that, enter that kind of environment. Uh, but no, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any, no. <laughs> any chance of Larkin being converted so by church going. Does it say something about Latter-day Christianity then? So many Christians like it, they get on with it, and think that Larkin is one of them. Mm. Is that something that Larkin is saying? Do, do, do they think he's one of them? Sorry. Do, do they think he's one of them? Yes. Um, or just expressing an attitude that's... The, 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 the director that you invited here, um, Patrick Garland. Patrick Garland's a perfect example. He came here, he was a member of the society. He's absolutely um, devout, you know, religiously. And uh, we've had various speakers in, in over the years who have written long essays. I've actually printed them. <laughs> about Larkin, saying that Larkin was really a Christian. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think yeah. that says more about them than about Larkin. You agree? Yeah, that? perhaps perhaps an element of uh, projection going on there. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting point. Thank you, James. Have we got any more any more questions? Yes. My question is for, uh, for Alexandra. It probably says much more about how detached I am than you today than anything <laughs> else. But I was interested in the fact that you said um, that in regard to what is referred to as cancel culture, they, were, they separate the person from the art, whereas my understanding was that the whole shebang went once the cancel culture was Absolutely. being employed. I wonder if, they, if you'd say a little bit more about how they were able to divide those. Was that specially for Philip Larkin, or is that a general uh, I, attitude? I feel as though these 10 weeks have maybe made them think differently about the, the ways they're being encouraged to be outraged uh, in the modern world at the moment and particularly on the platforms that perhaps they engage in um, because um, in fact uh, you're right the, ca the, the notion of cancel culture sort of suddenly denies any anything good about anything a, a person has ever produced um, I think the point I was making about Lady Chatterley was that they were quite surprised that you know an artist could be sort of revered um, accepted, engaged with, debated with, but that piece of work that they'd done was out, that was banned. And they, they found that quite uh, astonishing, really. The idea, more sort of akin to them, is that if they've made something unacceptable or they've said something unacceptable, the whole thing goes. So you're, you're absolutely right. But I think that this, um, this project did, did push us sort of beyond that um, to a place where you weren't you weren't being made to endorse what an artist had said or, 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 or done, but you were expected to engage with it and perhaps move beyond either outrage or a sort of censorious disappointment that it turns out we're all human. And, you know, that ability to reflect a little bit more on the fact that we've all done things either intentionally badly or unintentionally badly or that have come out wrong and that we would like to now refine or retract in some way. I don't think the world 
is very helpful at training the young in those skills at the moment. So was it a learning curve for them? Definitely, to yeah, to the point where really they good. want me to choose somebody else a bit controversial, if possible, for us to explore. It's almost as though they want me with them to kind of, you know, take them through that process um, of sticking with it and not doing the thing they want to do, which is just go, oh, I'm not supposed to, you know, engage with that now then, yeah. And this paper, when the book came out in 1960, uh, I managed to get a copy of the um, University of London bookshop. I was just starting research, and the professor of medics I was getting instructed from, I hadn't seen it, and he wanted to get it so he could be put in. It caused a great stir at the time. Yeah, but I'm saying, you know, of course, of course now I'd be so delighted if any one of my students came in and said, I read Lady Chatley's last week, you know, <laughs> I'd love that, yeah. I'd love that, let's talk about that then, you know. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Graham? Can I just say, what you said, Alex, uh, your talk, it, it kind of proves to me that marking doesn't need to be on the Yes. You know, you can, you can do, you can use, I mean, your students are very lucky to, 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 to have that project. But I thoroughly believe that. I mean, during the summer when, you know, it was a cultural vandalism, um, my greatest claim this year um, to do with that was having turned down an interview with Nigel Farage. <laughs> he wanted to interview me as chair of the Larkin Society just so that I could demonstrate my outrage. Mm. Yes. I, I wasn't at all outraged. As, as Lynn said, I was more infuriated by the title of the next piece, and I was about the exclusion <laughs> of the uh, laughing from the syllabus. Um, it, it, I, I, one of my, I was interviewed by one two people, and you know, my response was that Larkin uh, said it was a kiss of death being on the syllabus, <laughs> you know, and that because once you get into the academic machine, you get, you get chopped to bits, um, whereas what you were doing, taking them out of the syllabus, using your lunchtime, over the period, participatory, I think that's the way poetry will survive in the market, so well done. Oh, well, thank you. It did feel quite appropriate, given that he was sort of of the university and also slightly not of the academic mm -hmm. un part of the university. It felt quite fun to do do it sort of on the black market. <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts are we on lunch, Lynn? Um, yeah, so lunch is out now. Um, so thank you very much. I don't know if there's any more questions. Well, I think any more questions maybe we can ask over lunch. Yeah. 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 Okay. So lunch is in the room over there. Um, I ordered a kind of like a. I ordered one thing. We've got something else. <laughs> uh, let's put it that way. Um, and what we've got, I think Philip Larkin would have preferred. It's apparently called a, a, a ploughman's bento box, which is a bit of a mix of cultures. <laughs> um, and it's. Uh, my main issue was really trying to cater uh, for kind of vegetarian as well as um, people that aren't vegetarian. This is not a vegetarian lunch. Um, I've asked for some, uh, they've brought out four vegan lunches. So if you um, are vegan, you know, if you're not vegan, can you please kind of let, let people get those? If there's anything with that lunch that it's like a, an allergy or you, you just can't eat that lunch, do let me know. And I think, you know, they, they're, they're trying to sort it out. But I think, I mean, you know, it's fine, really. Um, we'll have what we ordered tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> Great. OK. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully so, it's OK. Just say thank you again to our speakers and give them one more round of applause.